to the comic shop I'll let you read about Cyclops I'll have you spending all you got Ravage is looking hot Dick son Don't call it a comeback. Big Legit's been here for years, ready to talk to you about more awesome comic books that do what? They move the needle. That's right, and it's Mark Silvestri Appreciation Week here on Testosterone Overload. I just got done talking to you about this gem earlier today, Cyberforce Origins Psyblade. Had a lot of fun talking about this, but we're gonna fast forward from January of 1995 to the spring of 1995 and talk about one of the most enduring image characters of all time, Bam, Rip Claw. Now, first thing you're gonna notice, wizard number one half. To give you a, an idea of what this is about, wizard was the guide to comics when I was a kid. And one of the really cool gimmicks they did, other than sometimes including a, a trading card in every polybagged issue of wizard, they would have a certificate you could fill out and send in to redeem a comic book, a one half. Wizard started this gimmick of releasing issue number one half, and it's actually really cool. And this cover is like some interesting type of plastic. This is not glossy. The filling on this is literally like, I mean, like you're holding a plastic cup in your hands rather than a glossy piece of paper. And I find that very unique because I have not seen uh, a Wizard comic that was like this before. I've never seen any comic that had this kind of a cover before, and it's really cool. Um, 1995, the springtime, this is right around the time I was kind of uh, getting out of comics, I would say. Um, at least my, my role in the comics world as a fan was diminishing greatly because I was uh, fast approaching getting a car. Uh, I had a friend with a car, so you don't have a lot of time for comic books as soon as you have a car. But anyways, Wizard One Half, Starts with a great script by Mark Silvestri and David Wool. The pencils here are by David Finch. He is one of my favorite artists of all time. The first uh, 13 pages of this are a story about Ripclaw and, and kind of his origin. This all takes place before he was part of Cyberforce. So basically he's running around in the woods and he sees this vision of a demon and he goes to attack it, jumps right through it, and we've got this old shaman sitting here, and this shaman is gonna play an important part in the upcoming uh, Ripclaw series. That was uh, entirely un unimpressive, Robert Bearclaw. Your tracking skills were better when you were a toddler. This deterioration is quite unlike you. You know that these exercises are important too. These games are wasting my time, Oeda. Hunting formless immaterial beasts leads me nowhere. I'm not in the employ I am now in the employ of Cyberdata. It is their goals that I strive for. It is their missions that are important to me. This is not the real world. Have you forgotten all of your lessons? You disappoint me, child. And he like touches him on the head and makes this crazy stuff happen. And like all of a sudden, like the monster becomes real. What? And he's gotta fight this demon. So back and forth, awesome brawl, lots of action. Uh, light on the dialogue, which is always, you know, fun because that's the sign of a talented writer. A talented writer doesn't need to include a lot of dialogue. A talented writer shows. He doesn't tell. And that's the key. That's one of the keys to successful writing is to show, not tell. Uh, I can tell you what happened here or I can just do this. And you can see it for yourself. There it is. You don't need me to tell you what any of this says anyways. So basically, you know, uh, you are a fool, boy. Watch it, old man. Your newfound arrogance is quite disturbing. There is so little you actually understand, young Robert. Have you already forgotten what happened to your brother? So they set up that he has a brother. The plight he experienced is nothing compared to the power possessed by the greater demons that exist in the mystical realms. There are diabolic threats looming that you must be prepared to face when I am gone. I'm a soldier for cyber data. They have chosen me to do their bidding, and I obey. This land is no longer my home. So basically he turns his back, but the wise shaman is, you know, not worried about it. Don't worry, my friend. He'll be back. It's his destiny. He shall soon see his cyber data for what they truly are, and only then will he return to resume his training. I just hope that by then it's not too late for all of us. So this is the beginning. And then what's really cool about these wizard one halves is you flip the page and sometimes you get something like this, which is a, a great article by Michael Berry about Ripclaw. 
I'm not going to read this to you, but you can go pick this up for a buck at your local comic shop or like me at my comic shop. I got this for 50 cents, 50 measly cents. And I guarantee you back in the day, this was at least eight to $12 at a comic shop uh, during the height of the, the 1990s speculative market. And this is quite a thorough little write up here. I mean, this dude wrote one, two, this is three pages. Good, good for you, Michael Berry. Uh, Michael Berry uh, is a freelance writer based in Northern California. And then you get to this really cool sketchbook. And these are sketches by Brandon Peterson. Brandon Peterson is uh, the guy who is actually going to be drawing the Rip Claw series for Image that this book is basically a promotion for. And, uh, you know, we got lucky to get David Finch's beautiful artwork in this. Uh, and you get to see, you know, some of the stuff that uh, Peterson is been working on here, getting ready, a little sneak peek. So that's kind of fun. Very inspiring for all you wannabe artists out there to pick up these wizard one halves and kind of see what these guys are doing and how they develop their images. So anyways, that's wizard one half. And what else is really cool is it comes with a certificate of authenticity to certify that this issue is uh, authentic with the great uh, signatures by Garib Shamus, publisher of Wizard Press and Patrick McCallum the editor-in-chief at that time of Wizard. Those are obviously printed on. They're not, they didn't go through and hand sign all these. Um, so that's what you get with every Wizard one half. But let's talk about Rip Claw since we're here enjoying Mark Silvestri Appreciation Week on Testosterone Overload. So as I said, this is uh, drawn by Brandon Peterson. The story is by Eric Silvestri, who is one of my favorite image writers. Uh, the entire Cyberforce miniseries, as I've discussed before, was really enjoyable. And I'm going to put that all on Eric Silvestri and, of course, on Mark Silvestri, who did all of the art while his brother did all of the writing. So basically, you know, in this, I'm not going to get into too much detail, but you can see that Brandon Peterson's art continues to get better, uh, a lot better. And not to say that his art was bad when Image first picked him up, but it's amazing how vastly you can improve when you're drawing a book every month or even sometimes two books or a cover here, a cover there, whatever. So basically, uh, villains are looking for a moonstone. And of course, we have my favorite character, which is this dirty broad Killjoy, half vampire, half pirate, half cybernetic freak, burned in an accident. You can find out more about her in the Cyberforce source book number one. And you've got this guy, Shadow Blade, who, you know, his eyes are covered. He's like he's Geordie LaForge or something here. I'm not sure if he's Native American. I'm wondering if this is going to end up being the brother of Rip Claw. Uh, I'm curious to find out because he's got the tassels and he's just kind of got this uh, Native American vibe, despite having a sword, uh, which Native Americans obviously weren't really that known for at all. I did not have swords, uh, but this guy does. And so they're looking for this moonstone, and this is this is the same shaman from the one half. He looks noticeably different, uh, which kind of threw me off, but he does have the same name, Oeda. And basically, they, they blow the hell out of everything, but it's uh, it's unstoppable dude. Because uh, he knows that the moonstone was not meant for the likes of you, daughters of demons, mother of death. Witness what the spirits think of your arrogance and greed. So basically, like, this guy uses his Native American power to just uh, I explode everything. And they run, and, you know, they're waiting because they want that. She wants that moonstone really bad that's around his neck. She wants that. We are going to talk about this. Not on this video, but this is going to be part of Mark Silvestri Appreciation Week, too. <laughs> Uh, so here we are years later, we've got uh, this, this professor, Professor Pike, who's digging around in this opening in the ground. This is like some Native American burial grounds, but it's actually a lot more. There's a lot more stuff that was going on here, and out of nowhere, like this, this mysterious monster shows up, and we don't know what happens because we cut, cut the scene, we go to a new scene. Her mother was a Navajo, born to the Deerstream people for the Flat Rock Clan. She told her many stories, some about the moon. One night, after one of her favorites, the one where the moon gets eaten by a bear, she gave her the stone. So, boom, here we go. Here's the moonstone. There's a nice close-up of the moonstone so that you can understand. Her name is Moonsong, not her first name. Her last name is Moonsong. 
Um, let me keep going here. Uh, so then, then we have, uh, it doesn't look like it, but this is Ripclaw. You can tell by the claws. Um, and he's being led. This is actually a really fun part is he talks to the animals and the animals talk to him through these cool thought bubbles. So, you know, he's got this wolf that's leading him to an owl. And I don't know if this is part of the Illuminati. I don't know if Mark Silvestri joined the Illuminati and that's why he put the owl in here. Uh, I'm going to, I'm going to guess yes. Yes. At the Playboy Mansion one night, Mark Silvestri was involved in a secret ceremony uh, that made him part of the New World Order, and this is him signaling to to his brethren in the New World Order. And, uh, you know, if, uh, if I'm doing this comic book, it is so that I can join the New World Order. That's why I'm reviewing this, and, and I guess the jig is up, you know. NWO. For life. So anyways, then he wakes up. Oh, it just turns out that it's, uh, it's a dream. And he's got a phone call. It's Laura. Laura Moonsong Pike. Ah, the plot thickens. So the, the stone was given to Laura by her mother, but this is her father who was attacked by the beast. He's the professor. So, and she's calling because she needs help because she's afraid something terrible has happened. So this is also Ripclaw in his more natural human form. Still very pale for a Native American. Um, so the following day at an Indian reservation in upstate New York, uh, basically they're building a casino right next to these sacred grounds and all these Native Americans are protesting here. And he shows up to talk to Laura and the guards aren't going to let him in, but oh, it's all right, it's a friend. And, and it turns out she's like dating this, this douchebag here who wears this pinstripe suit and he's the guy that's building the casino. And there is there used to be something between them like, I don't know if they ever actually dated. She has feelings for him. But now she's with Mr. Ogashun. And this looks kind of cool, actually. T minus four. The countdown begins in May. Weapon zero. I don't have any memories of this, but this looks like some fun sci-fi. I like the way these two are drawn a lot. I like the villain, too. I don't know what Ballistic Studios is. I don't know at all. Don't have a clue. Um, but also, again, art by Joe Benitez, who does great work. He did the Cyblade comic, if you recall. Joe Benitez. Joe Benitez. Okay, anyways, I might have to pick this up if I can find a copy for 50 cents or a dollar. Oh, the city of Syracuse in upstate New York. Oh, grandfather, grandfather, he wants the stone, the one you gave me. I don't really understand who this little boy is or where he came from. I'm going to go back to see. Is that mentioned? No. Uh, no, it's just Jim and her are getting married next week. That's Ogashun. Jim Ogashun. Laura's going to marry him. And then all of a sudden, we've got this little boy. This demon man shows up to take the moonstone. So I'm, I have a feeling that there are multiple moonstones in this comic book. But I'm not quite clear about that. I wish that... Uh, the writing was a little more clear as to that. So it turns out that this is not a man. It's a demon in disguise as a man. Like he can turn, like he can manifest a snake. He turns this sword, in fact, into a snake. Like the little boy goes, it's not a sword, excuse me, it's a knife on his ankle. He goes for it and it turns into a snake. Kind of a nice labyrinth vibe, like when David Bowie, you know, like is messing around and then like throws the whatever at her and it turns into a snake. Remember that one? Anyway, so like the little boy is just like, no way. And he uses his magical, I'm guessing, uh, First Nations powers to blow up the entire house. And he's mad. If I were a lesser demon, you may have stood a chance against me, boy. But I am Dunonges. Crappy name. Dunonges, lord among demons, ruler of the Shadowlands, and soon to be master of this, the world of mortal men. But first, the stone. I must have the stone. The boy is just like, uh oh. See, this is uh, this is what the '90s were also all about uh, for preteen boys. Swimsuit specials, man. This is before you could get your hands on a Playboy. You got your hands on a Image Comics or an X Men swimsuit special, and you just enjoyed that for days. That night in a room at the Fox Head Lodge. So we don't know what happens to the little boy. This is, this is good writing. This is good writing. We're going to cut out of this scene early. Leave us wondering. That night, in a room at the Foxhead Lodge, adjacent to the casino, 
Um, she is dressed in some really sexy lingerie here. The moonstone is glowing and she's thinking about how much she still cares for Robert. She didn't know that Robert Bearclaw is Ripclaw. She didn't know she still had those feelings, but what should I do? I'm supposed to marry Jim next week. And typical girl about to marry some douchebag that she doesn't really love. But you know, this is par for the course, young men. This is, this does happen in the world. I know for a fact that women marry men they don't really love. They do it for security. Um, security, you know what I'm saying? Security. Uh, but then they end up regretting it and they get divorced in four or five years and they have a kid in there and so then the kid grows up without like the birth father and big nightmare. So basically here's what I wanna say to you kids relating to this. Go to church, meet a girl in church. You won't have this problem happen. Uh, don't have kids out of wedlock you won't have the problem I'm just talking about happen. You don't want to be the dad who ends up a weekend dad every other weekend because you uh, married some sexy chick who really didn't give a crap about you, but she liked that you already owned a house and you had two kids already from another shitty relationship you already got out of. So don't screw up your life. Number one, wait till you're 30 to have kids. Number two, wait till you're married to have kids. Number three, make sure you're married to a woman who is as strong and forthright and based as we're teaching you to be with these comic book reviews. Uh, and typically you're gonna find that type of a girl in a church. I'm not gonna go into denominations or any of that. You, you figure out your religion for yourself. I'm just giving you some guidance here. You don't have to like it. I don't care. If you're an atheist and you got a problem with what I'm saying right now, I don't care. Okay? I don't care. I could go into it more, but we're going to leave it at I don't care. So if you don't like what I'm saying, move along. Jog along. Just wait for me to be done talking, and then we'll get back to the comic book. But young men need some lessons in life, especially nowadays in the 21st century when there's a lot of confusion as to what is right, what is wrong, what is morality, what is virtuous, uh, what is based, what is not, what is uh, uh, the American way. You hear a lot of politicians like to say, that's not who we are. Well, what does that even mean? That's who half of us are. Maybe that's who 75% of us are. It's just some vocal minority wants to shout and scream that that's not who we are because they're not getting their way right now and they want to be in charge and you're not letting them be in charge and that's not fair. And it doesn't matter what kind of hell they bring about on earth, as long as they're in charge, that's all they care about. So anyways, I digress. Back to the great comic book. She's pining over Robert Bearclaw and which one of these dudes she should be with and the moonstone's glowing and all of a sudden this hand comes in the frame and I thought it was gonna be Jim, the uh, the pinstripe douchebag with the casino, for sure, who's about to pick up the moonstone. No, it turns out it was it was Killjoy, broke in here with Shadow Blade, and you know the chick didn't even hear, didn't even hear him come in the room. That is quiet. That is quiet. So you know, she's like, a, a fine looking, a fine looking stone, is it not Shadow Blade? Reminds me of something we saw years ago, something I really wanted but couldn't have. I hate when that happens. It makes me so angry. And she's like, yes, I understand what you mean. I get that way myself. It's something that comes over you, something you can't control. Isn't that true? And she turns into like totally wicked, like demon warrior chick of some sort. And they just get this awesome chick fight going on here. And look how, yeah, I love this art, man. This is just great art. Brandon Peterson's art has, man, it just gets better with each issue. It's really amazing. Um, so anyways, we had a xenomorph once. He didn't work out, couldn't control him. Who are you talking about? Ripclaw! And Ripclaw, of course, dives through the window to save the woman he secretly loves but doesn't want to admit to. And we have another awesome fight and he totally just destroys her jaw. This is really wicked looking. There's all this action, but then you look here and I'm not quite sure because she still has a lower jaw. Did, the, did her face get torn off? I'm, just, it's kind of confusing, but it's just, it's awesome panel, so who cares, right? So anyways, they run 
For some reason, this doesn't make sense. Don't trouble yourself, Ripclaw. We were just leaving. Sorry about your friend. If there's anything I can... Get out! They were after the Moonstone, weren't they? Yes, but why? It means nothing to them. Unless there is something about it my mother never mentioned. And you know, you know there's going to be something her mother never mentioned. We already know that's coming. So early the next morning, they get on the bikes and I... This is really nice ink. This, is, this looks really nice. This kind of reminds me of... Jim Lee's death blow, in a way. I don't want you to get confused. It's Rip Claw still, even though you don't see the claws and he doesn't have the cool paint on his hand. You notice in this picture, yeah, that's definitely him. And he's got like, you know, the red war paint. But I think the red war paint only appears on his face like when he's enraged and using his First Nations powers to turn into Rip Claw. I'm not sure how all that works yet. Uh, hopefully we'll be able to get a Cyber Force Origins Rip Claw, but it wasn't in this one, you know. Maybe, maybe someday we'll find out. So anyway, they go. They go to the cave. Remember, her father, the Professor Pike, was down in the ancient burial grounds, and the monster attacked him. So they go to check it out. And uh, you know, sure enough, this was indeed a burial site, and much, much more. We cannot stay here. Why? What's wrong? An evil presence, angry, searching, getting stronger. Go, Laura, quickly, before it's too late. And boom, giant demon monster is hovering over them, and it looks totally awesome. It makes you want to buy issue number two of this great comic book called Ripclaw from Image, Top Cow, Mark Silvestri, Appreciation Month here on Testosterone Overload. And then they give you, you know, a few more ads. All for Mark Silvestri Top Cow products. I'm not sure. Here we go with the Ballistic Studios again, and I'm still not sure. Hmm. What works? Don't know. Anyway. This. Oh, yes. This is the Pit CD. Now, if anyone out there <laughs> watching this video happened to get a hold of the Pit CD, if it ever actually came out, I really don't know. It was also available on cassette, apparently. If you have this and you have uploaded it to YouTube, please let me know. Put a link in the comment section below because I am sure that comic book fans would love to find out what this is all about. Here you can be part of something big. You can join the Image Fan Club. You get a one-year subscription to the Mighty Eye, an exclusive Image Fan Club t-shirt, an Image button, personalized membership certificate, members only get merchandise discounts, and a birthday gift during your special month. Okay, okay, experience the cutting edge. Kill Razor special coming out in June of 1995. It looks like Top Cow really hit the ground running in 95. Coming out with this Rip Claw, the Cyber Force Origins, this Kill Razor special, uh, Cyber Force's Assault with a Deadly Woman. This is a trade paperback. I'm not sure if it reprints something or if it is an original trade paperback. Uh, some people out there say graphic novel. This isn't a graphic novel. This is a trade paperback. A graphic novel is a comic book for mature audiences. This would be a trade paperback. Uh, when you have issues, you know, one through four collected together in one book, that's called a trade paperback. It's not called a graphic novel. Whoever told you that has been lying. But anyways, to my point, Ripclaw by Mark Silvestri, art by Brandon Peterson, is absolutely off the chain. Looking at this cover, you know that it moves the needle. It will continue to move the needle for probably another 50 years until comics get back to this point where they look awesome. Where they look awesome. Where they look totally, totally awesome. Anyway, I wanna know if you read Ripclaw as a kid. I wanna know what your favorite image one half, or excuse me, your favorite wizard one half is. I want you to tell me in the comments below. Should I keep collecting this Rip Claw series? Uh, I know, I don't think it got to issue 25. I don't think it ran that long. I think it ran a little over a year. If I should collect the whole thing, please tell me below why. Is it worth it? Did it continue to hashtag move the needle? All right, that's it. That's what I got uh, here on Mark Silvestri Appreciation Week on Testosterone Overload. I'm going to be back, and I'm sure it's going to have something to do with Mark Silvestri because I've just gone down the top cow rabbit hole, and I can't seem to get out this week. So I appreciate you guys listening. Please give a, a like to this video. Please subscribe. Hit that ding dong if you want notifications. And I look forward to talking about more comics with you in the future on Testosterone Overload.